Hello and welcome to this National Poetry Day broadcast brought to you by the Linen Hall Library. In many ways, the Linen Hall Library might be considered as the home of poetry in Belfast. Our long established connections with wordsmiths like Heaney and Longley, I think, are testament to that. Not to mention our extensive literary archives and collections, which we would encourage you to engage with. The theme for this year's National Poetry Day is Vision with a strap line of See It Like a Poet. And joining us today uh, is Gerald Daw, a Belfast-based poet uh, and prolific writer whose awards and distinctions I think are almost too many to mention. Uh, but his most recent publication, uh, titled Looking Through You, Northern Chronicles, uh, is receiving great reviews. And it's available here uh, to pick up and read at the Linen Hall Library. Also joining us is uh, another Belfast poet, Stephen Sexton, uh, who's currently based at the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University. Um, again, his, uh, his distinctions and his awards are almost too many to mention, uh, but his reputation uh, continues uh, to gather pace, and so we are delighted to have both Gerald and Stephen with us today. What follows is an hour's worth of engaging conversation uh, between Gerald and Stephen really on the topic of uh, poetry in a time of crisis and how these two poets see themselves and see their work uh, in times of difficulty. So I would encourage you to sit back and relax and enjoy this online contribution uh, to National Poetry Day from the Linen Hall Library. Hi, Jerry. Uh, Hello so there. so uh, the next uh, National Poetry Day is themed uh, with, with vision. Um, and I think we, we would like to talk about, about vision a little bit, but more so um, vision, poetry, um, particularly in times of crisis, if, uh, if that's a, a direction. And I suppose one of the things I thought we might t uh, start by talking about is maybe that really, that old question. It seems like an old one. Um, you know, is, is there a responsibility, do you think, to, to act, to, to witness as a, as a poet or writer? I mean, we, we, maybe we acknowledge the, the times no matter what we do. You know, you, you write a poem at a certain time, it's got to be reflective of that time. Is there any kind of responsibility, do you think, to, to witness? Well, I think it, it, a lot of this always depends upon the individual. I don't think you can be generic about it. Um, my sense is that there are some poets who... Uh, are driven by a sense of witness or testimony and that they have that in their DNA um, which is not to say that they're political writers necessarily but that, that they're very the flaps are around them um, and uh, you know it's not exclusively a personal experience that the poems are conveying uh, it's tied in with uh, a public or civic or a political event um, and that out of the out of their awareness of that event uh, the poems come um i mean you just have to think of someone like yeats who refused to write a poem about the first world war but in so doing wrote a poem about not writing a poem about the first world war i mean there are ways around this um uh, in in my own sense of uh, what i've been doing as a poet I kind of resisted anything to do with uh, the public world, the world of, shall we call it, responsibilities. Um, but it ended up that uh, growing up in Belfast in the late 60s, early 70s, it was impossible not to have some uh, awareness of what was happening around you. Um, now, I know we don't want to go down the, the route of the poetry of the troubles and so on, but uh, I mean, that kind of pressure on um, an individual will ultimately or eventually reflect itself in the work that's written either as a poet or uh, a novelist or a dramatist uh, it'll be inscribed in the work somewhere mm -hmm. um one of the things that intrigues me is the differences between our generations i mean you're the younger generation i'm the elder part of that generation and uh, my experience growing up uh was uh in a society which was fr relatively free uh, in the 60s uh, and what happened at the end of the 60s was that collapsed and the society that I'd grown up in and was familiar with, that that had entered into this, as we know, quarter century of crisis. Um, but you came in towards the latter part of all that. How did you, how do you feel about the sense of responsibility and obligation? 
You know, it's it's very it's very interesting, and and I mean, one of the one of the phrases that I, I or, or quotes I guess that I, I think of often in many contexts is that one that I think Maeve McGuckian used it in in one of her books, maybe the Flower Master, the the one from uh, Picasso. Um, I have not yeah. painted the war, but I have no doubt the war is in these paintings I have done. Yeah. Um, and you know, on, on, I, I'm, I'm, you know, fascinated by that when I think of, you know, whatever you do, like Yeats, as you, as you described, you know, by not writing it, you're writing it in, in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely true. Um, I mean, one of the things I suppose that one thinks about often is, I mean, my sense of history, um, you know, of, of the history immediately before um, I was born and, you know, for the first part of my life. I mean, there was very much, you know, the, the violence that you talk about, the crisis you talk about. But I think for, you know, for me, certainly, um, there was very much that resistance for a different reason. You know, I, I suppose perhaps in the 60s and 70s, one might be resisting writing about it because of, you know, its contemporary nature and, and the fact that it, it, is, it must be very hard to write about something as it's happening, I suppose. Mm. Um, in my case, I suppose I was always very resistant because I didn't feel like I have any real claim to it. You know, it didn't affect my life personally and directly the way that it did others. Um, and I, I think maybe of you know the, the generation of, of poets from this part of the world, such as um, Leon Schifflin, say, or, or Sinead Morrissey, who I think were also very careful um, about not you know about uh, about allowing their their work and their poetry to be about other things, you know, to to not continue um, you know directly down that route. Um, so for me, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's strange as I think about it, and uh, you know, the, you know, this last. Um, five or so years that you know of i mean crisis is the right word isn't it in in europe and in, in the us um in in northern ireland and ireland um of course too um i do feel that, you know this weird compulsion to say something and and yeah. and, 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 and i'm resisting that at every turn and, and also during this this moment that we're in at the moment um you know, if, if one of the, the ancient roles of poet was as historian um should you know in ireland certainly should 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 we acknowledge, you know, this this new world that we're in? Shouldn't we? Um, yeah. You know, is it so so uh, so common an experience that no one can really add anything remarkable to it? I mean, that's one of the things that I wonder about. Yeah, I'm with you 100 percent on that. I mean, sometimes the uh, obligation is uh, is self motivated, and it's an honourable one, and it's trying to make sense for yourself of what's happening around you uh, in a private in private sense. Uh, loss, grief, mourning, uh, celebration, love, uh, pleasure. Um, I mean, all these things are part of a poet's uh, experience. And she or he, uh, you know, gets great uh, value out of writing about these things. But when the shadows appear and when, uh, you know, something like the pandemic or uh, a, the kind of morality that the, the crisis of morality that we seem to be in, not attached to the pandemic, but in, 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 attached to the relationship between language and truth, uh, between uh, language and ideology. I mean, you, I almost feel like saying, you know, uh, as I think about these things as a, as a living, writing uh, individual, uh, I have to say something about the way in which language is being traduced uh, by politics. Um, but then what can you say? Get off my patch, you know, you're messing it up. Um, so it, 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 in some way, I think the moral dimension has become even more visible today. Um, trying to honor those that passed away through the pandemic is one thing. I haven't experienced that, but I know there are some close who have, who, who have seen uh, loved ones go this way through the pandemic. Uh, similarly through the troubles. Um, uh, so, I mean, poets have that kind of connection to uh, mourning, to commemoration, uh, and that's something that has been with, with the poetic, poetic life since um, Adam was a boy. Uh, there's no way around that. Um, but there's the other side of that coin, and I'm curious to hear what you've got to say about this. Uh, I. I can never quite remember, was it Larkin or Auden? But one of the two of them said, in fact, it could even be Patrick Kavanagh, uh, that there's nothing worse than an important thing. Uh, I mean, it's a phrase that sticks in my mind that in some way, um, uh, history or politics or crisis should not be seen to be, you know, uh, energizing poetry. 
it shouldn't be uh, just because you're writing about something which is uh, grotesque or hugely damaging or um, you know a crisis of some kind or another. That's not necessarily going to make that poem work. Um, and it's I mean it's something that has always been in my mind because I am interested in writing about politics. I am interested in writing about things like cultural identity and uh, uh, as I say the misuse of language. But I'm also conscious of the fact that in so doing, am I in some way trying to achieve significance? Not through the poem, but through what I'm writing about. Do you follow me? Absolutely. Do you have any understanding of that? Do, do you have any consciousness of that? Um, I do, but I, I suppose maybe the way that I, I, I treat those, those sorts of things is is maybe as, you know, as, as subjects, you know, as you say. And I mean, I suppose when I come to a poem, what I want is, is I want language to be shaped or formed or mm. affected by a subject, mm. you know, being merely um, about it often doesn't thrill me, let's say, yeah. you know, um, and, yeah. you know, I, I suppose, um, you know, I, I'm fascinated, I suppose, um, uh, and perhaps related to our theme of vision, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea that, you know, 10 people can look at one painting, let's say, and, and have it affect them in, in you know, 10 different ways, um, maybe 20 different ways. Mm. Um, you know, it fascinates me that, that one subject resonates um, in, in such different ways for a number of people. Um, but what I want from a poem, I suppose, is I want to see that happen to the language. You know, I want yeah. to see, and, and it's, it's hard to, it's hard to see it all the time. And, and you know, it's, I don't mean to speak in a way that is kind of exclusive or anything like that. But I, I like to see language, you know, if the subject is some kind of black hole, I want, I want to see how language is warped as it approaches it. You know, I, I want to see these decisions. Um, I want to see the language changed, um, you know, in, in, in the face of this, this gravitational pull um, or something like that. Um, so when I think of subjects, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? And, and with the pandemic, you know, there are as many uh, views on the pandemic as there are, um, you know, people at, at this point. I mean, oh, it's indeed. really global. Uh, and it is, it is. And I mean, what vision, uh, uh, you know, you can attach to something which is as nefarious, as insistent, and as, in a way, civic as a mm. pandemic. I mean, we've had these plagues throughout the history of man. But uh, I don't think we've ever had one that's been so policed by statistics, by graphs, by public consciousness, by the extent to which it's an, in our everyday life. Um, I mean, that probably will lend itself towards fiction writing rather than to, to a, a poem or a poet writing about it. Um, but I mean, one of the things that has always in, sort of intrigued me is uh, from a point of view of writing a poem is what what is it going to leave behind uh, in the reader's mind I mean I th I think that poetry is an art form that should give pleasure uh, it should provide some sense of consolation it should uh, be enjoyable quite simply from a an oral point of view uh, but also you know there should be something intriguing about the language which brings the reader in um, I've never, I haven't been too interested in the poet. Uh, it, I'm, I'm much more interested in how the poem itself operates and, and, and uh, uh, provides some sense of uh, a challenge or uh, a record about a, a personal experience, an emotional uh, moment, or as you say, uh, a sense of like uh, the visual world that we all inhabit. Um, so in a way, uh, the vision doesn't attach itself really to the writer. Historically, I suppose there have been periods of literary history when it has done, like the Romantic movement, or uh, a poet, uh, Janus Ritsos, the Greek poet who was interned, and so much of his work was attached to his uh, isolation, being, uh, you know, uh, imprisoned, or the great Russian poets like Akhmatova or Mandelstam, uh, uh, whose lives were, in a way, imperiled uh, by the state. Um, I mean, I don't think we can attach ourselves to anything like that in our Western. So. No. And in many ways, I feel it's kind of like a, there's something morally incorrect, incorrect about so doing. Um, but maybe you should read one of your poems, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll get cracking on. on All right, well, that's we'll put our, 
put our words where our mouth is, so to speak. Well, yeah, let's hope so. Um, yeah. And especially after what you've just said, that you want some intrigue. Let's let's yeah. see if I can offer any intrigue. Um, I'll not say very much about this poem, except it's maybe about that very old uh, feeling. Um, and the one I think we're talking about, you know, how do you, how do you take pleasure in something amid all the reasons why you perhaps oughtn't? Um, so, you know, an, an older poem, certainly before these times, um, but still concerned, I suppose, with that. Um, let's see if that intrigue lasts. It's called uh, The Dancers. All the syrup-lighted afternoon, I watch the office block be dismantled into discretions. Half-moon desks rolled like a fiberboard month across the gummy carpet. The clank and tango of a filing cabinet impressed by three stout men towards the backmost stairwell, where the line of people standing one abreast snakes throughout the building's seven floors. I water the feeble mint and the oregano flowers and the hyacinths in the shade of my balcony, and the whippings start up again in the street below. On a bus somewhere, or a train, you come towards me, and the second generation children singing pop songs on the mezzanine, approximating the dance routines, whose fortunes of language they cannot cherish yet. You'll say, I've never felt such uncomplicated joy, and we'll stand there in the hall with your suitcases, listening to whatever rendition, whatever song. And you'll say, what a thing to share this flake of time in their company. What a thing wild lavender can still flourish in the grounds of the derelict church. Oh, wonderful. Um, I mean, as you read that and I listened to it, it made me think uh, that one of the other characteristics of vision um, is the sense in which it's an individual uh, vision. I mean, uh, we can't, uh, in 21st century Western reality, we, we really can't uh, uh, take over some inherited vision of the past. Uh, we're having to reformulate it all now. Um, and it's very much based down to the sort of privatization of the world, the sense that it's become such a hugely individuated world. Um, and the poet's witness, like as you record in the poem there, is watching the world and uh, recording what's happening to it uh, in its newness, in its uh, thereness. Uh, I don't want to be philosoph philosophical about this, but it just occurred to me that um, one of the features of vision may well be um, uh, how the poet uh, connects what he or she is looking at through language um, as being unique and th of this moment. Um, even though, you know, you can look back and it's Blake or it's Wordsworth or it's whoever, whosoever. Um, let me read, uh, uh, to echo what you've uh, just read. This is a poem, a very, very early poem of mine. In fact, it was the first poem that I felt that I had really said something. And it, uh, it was the title of my first book, published in uh, 1978, which is uh, quite some time ago now, when you think about it. I still find that hard to believe, but there you go. Um, it's called Sheltering Places. And it, it's actually about a storm, uh, as the poem has it. Uh, but I was visiting with my mother uh, in, in, in East Belfast, uh, back in the uh, early 70s and the poem records what exactly happened uh, actually it was in the uh, it was about 1971 I suppose uh, to be quite specific about it but it found its way into the uh, to become the title of the first book Sheltering Places so anyway here it goes it's been pelting down all night the kind of rain that drenches to the bone and a dirt storm in the car park the hot wind carries thunder, making girls scream, and old men count the seconds, improvising distance, as you shout to turn the lights out, pull down the blinds, so that lightning can't get in and frazzle us up. In the curtain dark room, the rumbles near, and shattering flashes make everything go numb. The storm is reaching home territory, stretching over the hills down into our sheltering places. 
So I suppose what you can you can make of that is the sense in which, in a way, history or uh, what's happening around us does move in towards the individual life um, and the sense of trying to protect the, dom the domos, the domestic, the family, the familial. Um, uh, maybe poetry becomes like a kind of a, 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 a source of reassurance, uh, of protection, as well as registering and recording what's happening out there. I was, uh, thank you, Jerry, for, for reading that. I was reading um, your. Uh, I was reading that book um, just again last week or the week before. And I mean, there is there is a. I suppose. Am I right in remembering? And forgive me if I'm wrong. Is that is that poem in sort of narrow uh, quatrains? Is it? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. And and you know, I mean, for me, that's that's one of the things that seems to make, or at least I'm making myself make sense. You know, this sense of. Uh, I mean, the orderliness or the implied order of that against you know the sort of chaos of the you know of what's happening in the poem. You know, the order. Yeah. Um, the order Order and the disorder. I mean, that is that is interesting and thrilling to me. You know, that is you know there is the storm coming. Yet the person talking, uh, the person telling me this is uh, is is composed to some extent. You know, or is 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 managing it. Is, is yeah. So the, well, maybe 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 you're onto something there. Um, maybe the struggle to produce a vision uh, and to see to see. See better, Lear, and let, rem let me remain the true blank of thine eye, as Kent has it in King Lear, that the way to actually see things is by controlling them, by ordering them, and that the form of a poem, rather than, in a way, releasing all that, has to contain it in some way. Um, I mean, I've had this ongoing argument with myself since I was a, a, a teenager about whether or not I really, really like the beat poets. Most days, some days I think they're great, and then some days I think they get away with it too easy. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's daft, but, uh, uh, and I, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of a, I mean, Ginsburg is, is Ginsburg a great poet because of the prophecies uh, about America and uh, his life? And those big, long, wonderful lines that kind of tumble out uh, opulent lines that run and run and run forever. Uh, it's letting go, isn't it? I Then the other bit of me, maybe it's the Puritan in me, I don't know, kind of reacts against that and says, no, the poem has to be contained. It has to be, as you said, the quatrains. It has to be orderly and ordered. And between the two, between the two, the kind of, the, the, the beat poet in me, uh, such, such as it is, wants to just let it all hang out. But then the Presbyterian in me wants it to be kind of mannerly ordered and maybe the dark shadows, the danger, the, the, uh, the damage is contained inside. You have to go looking. Do you experience that? I mean, it, it is partly uh, directly connected with the notion of, I mean, let's be honest, you don't sit down to write a poem and say, I'm writing a vision now. It Only doesn't Yeats happen, does do it? That. that doesn't <laughs> happen. <laughs> but, um, I mean, do you have that sense of a kind of combat uh, as you, you know, as you write your poem? Are you moving towards a sense of freedom, of opening things up? Or do you find yourself automatically Close, not closing things down, but shaping them into something that's kind of runs from left to right and looks mm -hmm. kind of tidy and tight, you know? Uh, I mean, one of the things I love about your book, If All the World uh, and Love Were Young, is just the way it, it, it runs between the two things. That one hand, you've got these contained uh, almost mini sonnets or pretendy sonnets, and then you have this kind of woof. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? It opens up into some other space. It's kind of you to say, Jerry. I mean, that's, that's absolutely what I was hoping for. And I, I should say that that book is, is also, it's a, you know, it's a concept album, really. Um, it's, not, it's not me as such. Um, but I, I suppose, and, you know, I feel as though the language is, the language is weird. I mean, it, it's all, I attest, uh, syntactically correct. But the lack of punctuation is perhaps challenging uh, to that. But, you know, I, I, was trying to, I was trying to find a way in English, in poetry in English, to describe what it is like to see a, a video game from the 1990s. Mm. And, you know, I mean, that, that for me, that, you know, 
a sonnet didn't quite work, you know, when I'm trying to describe that, you know, that, that impact on the eye, that couldn't quite, um, it didn't seem like I could find an easy way to do that without making yeah. some other decisions. Um, but I, I too, you know, I, I mean, that, that for me does seem to, to form a kind of central basis and it's a bit early in the day for me to be making proclamations about art but i mean you know some some Snap. sense sure i mean some sense of, of of stress and release or tension and release i mean seems to be a motivating force in you know in, in many of the things I, I like very much and return to and, and i suppose that tension between um you know when especially when it comes to to, to grief i think there is this sense of mm. um i want to tell you but i can't tell you or I can't tell you, but I need to tell you. And, and that, that tension being played out where, where someone finds the way to, to say what they really mean to say, even if it takes them a long time to do it. Um, I mean, if, if I might move on from, uh, you, you mentioned Presbyterians. Um, I thought I would uh, read, read a poem, uh, not, not by that. me. Um, Presbyterians is a bit of a stretch perhaps, but um, there's a, a poet I love is, is the American poet, Mary Rufel, um, who has written uh, a poem um, called The Last Supper um, after, after the famous painting, which I think is a, an admirable thing to do, to take on that painting yes. in quite a, quite a short poem. Um, but one of the things I love so much about this poem is that, you know, sort of by looking at it, she looks through it. And by looking through it, she manages to find herself, you know, 500 years ago. Um, and, and she, she goes into this, this image and, and she, I guess she sees herself in it in, in some ways, or at least the fiction of the poem uh, does that. But maybe I could read it. It's not very long. And I think that's kind of one of the humorous aspects of it. That this, this fine painting gets, at my guess, about 20 lines. Um, but uh, what can you do? Uh, so Mary Ruffles, The Last Supper. It made a dazzling display. The table set with the meat from half a walnut a fly on a purple grape, the grape lit from within and the fly bearing small black eggs. We gathered round the oval table with our knives, starved for some inner feast. We were not allowed to eat as we had been hired as models by the man at our head. Days passed in which we grew faint with hunger Later, we were told that although we did not appear on the canvas, our eyes devouring these things provided the infinite light. Mm. Who is that again? That's Mary Ruffle. Uh, she mm. is R R U E F L E. Um, but I'm, I, I'm. It's just that. I mean, again, that that question of. Uh, um, yeah, the, the, I suppose the idea that, that suffering is, is, the, is the thing that, that is responsible for this, that is yes. you know, her, her suggestion that, that, that for, this, for this work of art, um, people had to go through something they, they shouldn't have had to go through. And that is a moral question, isn't it? I mean, um, I mean without rehearsing issues like uh, Urza Pound or, uh, you know, the, uh, those writers who went down a particular political route, um, sometimes anti-Semitic or, or, or whatever it may be, uh, do we detach their ideologies, their politics from the actual poetry that they wrote uh, in the Cantos and, and Pound's case? Uh, I mean, it's always been a question, I think, that Irish poets from these islands um, have been tender about, uh, about the relationship between uh, their politics and their poetry. Um, uh, I mean, Yeats, I, I think we can say without a shadow of a doubt, I mean, his politics uh, from a certain point stank. Uh, I mean, he, and he, 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 he lost himself in, in strange uh, right-wing uh, beliefs and so on. But um, the other side of that coin, uh, maybe we should think about and talk about um, I mean, you've just read an extraordinary poem about, you know, how a poet reflects upon suffering. Um, well, I, I, I have a feeling that one of the key elements of uh, the responsibilities that we've been talking about or trying to sketch in uh, connects to uh, witness testimony, to seeing what's happening around and how, as an individual, irrespective of about being a poet, you can uh, reason with that. 
kind of work out what is happening in the world that you're currently living in and to try and not so much use the poetry, uh, use your poem, but the poem becomes a form of questioning. And one of the poets that uh, has meant so much to me in all that, it won't be a surprise, I'm sure, to you, is Louis McNeese. I mean, um, uh, the kind of resonances that uh, were out there in the early 60s as a young lad trying to find parallels to be a poet, to think about what I was doing as a writer. Uh, there were few and far between on the ground. Um, but McNeese, when, when I, I encountered him very early on, there was a kind of familial sound to his English, the way he wrote. Uh, the kind of vibrancy of his English and the fact that it was so tuned in to his contemporary world. Um, one of the poems that I, I adored, I mean, I read it incessantly. It was almost like playing an album con constantly, you know, not a, a, let it, just letting it, it was on a loop, was Autumn Journal. Mm. Uh, and of course, I suppose, I'm sure you agree that that is one of the great uh, poems of history but also about it, it's how a poet fits in. And then there's the love story running through it and, and so on. Let me read you a kind of uh, an imitation uh, version of Autumn Journal, which I wrote several, many, many years uh, uh, after the, those first encounters uh, with the uh, McNeese poem. And I called it, smartly enough, Summer Journal. Uh, uh, it's in three cantos and it has that kind of jagged quality of his, you know, the kind of... Uh, indented lines uh, and it basically it, 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 the poem tries to negotiate a phrase I don't particularly like but tries to negotiate the relationship between the private personal life and what is happening outside of that um, and um, uh, it, it, it's an attempt to, to both report history as it's about to happen but also to reclaim the integrity of the inner world, if that makes sense. I'm not sounding too kind of uh, phony. Um, okay, so it's in three stanzas, the three cantos, summer journal. And I dedicated it to a friend of mine, uh, a fellow poet um, from Trinity Days called Brendan Kennelly. Summer journal. Through the porthole of a window, the blue muggy night is perforated with the sound of foghorns. Dogs answer each other back, and then it thunders again with spectacular effect. The girls are sleeping in the cool apartment. Shadows like planes cast over the lawn. I'm in two minds between tender as the night and the TV's mute, hectic images, which flash worldwide the breaking news of a hillside trek and scorched villages, the bedecked impromptu briefing. The ignominious beetle covers oceans of sand, but the man or woman who drifts into the sky, paragliding over our prone bodies, family groups setting up makeshift home, couples in their prime and past their prime, the odd one alone stretched under the sun, where all are vulnerable, torn this way and that, naked, flat, in repose from the everyday at sixes and sevens, is trussed and hooked to the speeding boat, and cradles like a baby, looks down upon us all with far-seeing love and pity. Palm doves and swallows and the apricots and oleander, the cacophony of high season, poolside, middle Europa tans, and in silence observes a galleon take up the full of the bay. The rosé goes down like mother's milk. It's near 90, best head for cover. In the shade, local dance music beats through the scratchy airwaves to you on whichever island you stand. Let us dream it now and pray for a possible land. And the last two lines are uh, lifted from... from uh, Autumn Journal. But uh, without wanting to gloss the poem, I, I mean, I think it illustrates one poet's attempt to 
be aware of what was happening. I mean, it was the, 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 the first real breakup of Europe and the European wars uh, of, of, of the, the 1980s and 90s. Uh, Zebranitska and uh, what was happening in some of the other states was beginning to hit the news. Um, and I thought of the relationship between what was happening on the news and the life I was living on holiday with my wife and daughter and, and the relationship between the two. High, high, uh, there was a kind of catastrophic gap and that maybe that's what poetry can in some way uh, without being overly rhetorical, Phil. Mm. No, I'm inclined to agree. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a motivating force, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I've long been fascinated by, by Autumn Journal. I mean, I, I write in thinking that, it, is it published in, in, written in 30, is it published 39, published 38? Yes, mm. uh, and just as the war is about to break. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of those, I mean, it, it certainly foresees that, doesn't it? And it, it also, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of participating in that, in that mood at the time. I mean, do, do you have any, and, and we'll, we'll not um, perhaps have any, any seances or meetings at this point, but how, how, how interested are you in, the, in that other kind of vision of the, of the foreseeing of the, I mean, does it matter? Does a poem simply find its context? You know, it's not, it's, it's just things shift and sooner or later yeah. a poem seems like it's found uh, yeah. a different kind of moment. Yeah, I mean, sometimes resonances are, are waiting like an ambush hmm. uh, and they come like uh, 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 400 years later. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things that I, before I retired from teaching, one of the things I kept on banging on about, we should drive them daft, I think, was that there's literature is always contemporary. You know, you read... Uh, uh, Marvell, you read Spencer, you read Swift, and they're right on your shoulder. Um, there's not the, you know, that, that's the, the con connections are there, um, as you can see in the, the title of your book. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you know. Um, so, I mean, uh, th there, there, there's that sense that uh, literature is always now. But then there's the other thing, which we talked about before we started to do this. Uh, and it's something that I think we're a wee bit more cagey about these days, the notions of omens, premonitions, uh, not so much things that go bang in the night, but, you know, the way in which there is this other spiritual possibility of life. I mean, I grew up, uh, my grandmother and my mother uh, both had this sense of uh, an afterlife. Uh, they were both very prone and intrigued by spiritualism uh, by, you know, the language of, uh, well, actually, probably a ghostly language. Um, and uh, I don't know where that came from. I've no idea. But so I was kind of tuned into this from a very early age and also rejected it at a very early age because I felt, come on, let's get real here. We live in a rational world. But as you get older, suddenly you begin to think, well, maybe there are things like omens or premonitions or uh, anticipations of... Uh, for tellings. Mm. Um, and I think that poetry lives in the foretelling world. Um, I mean, uh, there is a sense in which, I mean, you've written uh, some wonderful poems of the, the language of, of nature, flowers, of such, such like. And, uh, you know, th these are foretellings or contexts out of which uh, grief and memory and loss are reconstituted or uh, reconvened in a way. Um, I find that very moving in your book. Uh, but maybe, maybe the hippies screwed up foretelling. Maybe that whole kind of hippie world, uh, you know, um, which I could never really take to. Maybe they kind of made made foretelling something that was kind of like a, a bit daft but i don't think it is mm -hmm. i think poetry is part of that world it's part of that uh anticipatory thing that you're you're i think you're nudging us towards yeah. i mean i mean aren't, aren't you sort of you know occasionally driven by impulses or thoughts that come from nowhere that yes. you know you follow and i mean you know i i, I said i'm not 
I'm not a spiritualist. I'm not practicing. You know, I have no <laughs> no, no globes that I study. But you know, I'm, you know I, I am fascinated. You know that these resonances are found, and you know it sort of seems like you know some kind of if you'll forgive the metaphor that I'm about to use, um, it seems like a very long metaphor in that there, there, is the, there is the first part of that metaphor that occurs, you know, today. And it's, on its second part, you know, it's, it's, it's realization, um, you know, it is, is a year from now, is 20 years from now, just this, you yeah. know, this long stretch that these two things are um, unmistakably connected, but we just didn't see how um, for, for some time, which I find interesting. Um, and I find it interesting too, and I could be wrong about this, but I seem to remember um, the first time I ever heard the name, uh, believe me, I'm not derailing us, the first time I ever heard the name Nostradamus um, was, I would say, the autumn of 2001, um, when everyone or many people were claiming that he had predicted uh, what, what happened in New York in, in, in September mm. 2001. Mm. Mm. And it, it strikes me that there, it seems like there must be some sort of strange connection with, with history, with the future, with the present, especially in times of crisis. You know, this, this impulse to join all these things together, yes. um, to, to control it, to, to be able to manage uh, trauma or fear or... Um, or all these, you know, absolutely recognizable and understandable feelings. That, that seems like an impulse to, to just thread these things together. To, to yeah, I think them. it's a human need to understand why what happened happened. Mm. I think you're absolutely spot on. But you know the other thing about that? If you step back from that, that reality or that experience, language contains inside it that uh, relationship, I think. Uh, but between when something happens and our efforts to make sense of that. Language, you know, as technicians, as language users or makers, we have to try in some way, out of an impulse or out of a desire to write something, we have to try in some way live inside the language and make it connect. Um, uh, I think that when that happens best is when it's unforced. When it, you know, uh, you obviously ha can have a shaping idea, as you said, like a theme uh, that will draw a book into its own coherence. But um, structure isn't going to answer everything. It has to come from some, I think, some emotional source within and there has to be some kind of energy that's driving that. I mean, there was a line, not bringing it back to myself for any other reason, just by way of illustration. There was a line that actually followed me around when I lived in Galway. Uh, that winter, I was like a man walking in a circle. No one else was near. I, I, I didn't know where the lines, it was two lines, where it had come from. I had no idea where it had come from, but I could not shake it off. Um, the hunger strikes appeared uh, and uh, our daughter was born and I, uh, I actually attached the reality of her birth seemed to make sense in connection with those two lines and I wrote a poem called Solstice. But it was almost as if it had nothing to do with me, these two lines. They were kind of dogging me. And that it was just waiting. Those two lines were kind of waiting, hanging around like a like a balloon, waiting to be earthed into something that happened. And that's what happened. And the, uh, I wrote that poem. But um, uh, let let's move on a wee bit and maybe try and get uh, some sense of uh, towards a conclusion. What do you think? Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, you have another poem you want. I've got to another read. poem. Well, let read. Let's see. I've got. I've got a choice of two. What? What? what, what? Well, let me. Let me read one that I mean is supposed to be kind of humorous, but you know, you can never tell, can you? Um, no, no, no. So, so, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, you know, writing poems as one do, uh, uh, as one does. Goodness, one doesn't write poems like that sentence. No. Um, but. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> so um, but for some reason or another, I, I have you know found myself in the company of of, of a character that I know nothing about, um, except that for some reason this character. Uh, this isn't our friend hmm. Mario, no. This isn't. This is this is someone I know even less. Um, okay. He's just come out of absolutely nowhere. The only thing I can say about this person is that for reasons I don't fully understand, uh, she she is gifted with some kind of psychic gift. Um, oh, she is a visionary, um, um, but you know, it's supposed to be funny, whether it is, I mean, who knows, but uh, we'll see. 
Um, all right. Um, Go and I noticed, I noticed, Jerry, you have a poem called The Messages. Um, oh, yes. The, the, the resonance here is, is both the messages and your sense of the messages. Yeah, um, going for the messages. Going for the messages. Which I always thought was a bit ridiculous. I mean, messages, you always think of something that comes into you. You don't go out for them. <laughs> but, you know, there are yeah, ways and means, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. The Messages. On Sunday afternoons, the price of broccoli may well drop by 80%. The noodles bear the pallor of the travel sick, but the uncontracted can't be picky, though the troubled, otherworldly stare of hunger only adds to the spooky aesthetic, lazy or at their wits end detectives expect from their local psychic correspondent, should the missing person remain undiscovered in the abandoned trophy factory, and the only recourse be supernatural. It's Cheryl who is waiting by the phone. Hers is a dying trade. There's no future in it, she'd say. But a gift wasted is a sin. However hard it is raising handfuls of boys on a couple of hours of work a month and agony anting for trashy magazines. But harder is catching the cashier's eye and not seeing the routine mysteries of love and divorce. But a, a moonlit winter's night, a multi-story car park a decade away, from somewhere a flash of bristling rage. And knowing the boys will be teenagers by then, or were already, or never won't be. Mm -hmm. I like that, I like that a lot. Very long sentences, I don't know what I was at. But here. Yeah, no, I know, I know. Um, uh, uh, well, why don't I respond with a, Please. a, a, a slightly shorter piece and, um, it 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 comes out of um, uh, a particular area in the west of Ireland called Ackle, um, and it, it does connect quite directly with our theme. Um, uh, your friend uh, in the poem um, had a sense of uh, foretelling of, of of waiting for the decade. What was the phrase? The decades to come. Uh, where, what was the decade? Uh, decades from now, a decade away. De a decade away, yeah. Uh, well, uh, what struck me uh, when I was on Ackle, I was staying in this wonderful resource called the Onrich Bull Cottage. And um, uh, I, I was doing some work there. And uh, when I was leaving, I just went around and to try and tidy things up. And um, I spotted in the corner of the, one of the rooms a little letter uh, which had been written by Ulrich Bull, the German novelist, uh, to his father. It was in German, but there was a translation alongside it, so I read it. And uh, I thought it was extraordinary. Ulrich Bull had lived in this, in this cottage in the 50s. Uh, he had uh, returned, or he had uh, moved to the west of Ireland physically and mentally to recover and psychically to recover from the war um, and uh, he went fishing and uh, the family were with him um, and it was a it was a real life in fact his son René I, I met and uh, he, 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 he remembers it so distinctly as being a real life not a tourist life but a real life living there um, and established with connections with the, the locals and, and so on uh, anyway, uh, when I was leaving, I kind of caught caught my eye. He was looking at me, Unruh Bull, with this little beret on. It was a photograph of him. Well, like I'm not being ghostly or spooky here. Uh, and I thought to myself, that must have been quite some experience to leave war ravaged Germany or Europe with your kids. He writes, he had written a journal about it, which is well worth reading, Irish Journal. Uh, and moving from Dublin to uh, the west of Ireland and then travelling up into this, as it was then in the 50s, remote island and setting up home there. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's quite an achievement, you know, for one human individual uh, to, to do at the time. There was no mobile phones, there was no internet, there was nothing there, just uh, human contact. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I went back and I actually looked at the letter and I wrote down a few of the, the lines um, 
uh, with which he concludes the letter to his father, and they conclude this little poem. It's in uh, uh, couplets, or kind of couplets, uh, and it's called Crossing the Sound, uh, which is the, 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 the link between the mainland on the island is the sound, and you cross the sound to enter into the island. But also, there isn't there something so resonant about that crossing the sound, like crossing the bar, the movement between one reality and another. Crossing the sound. Driving to the island, we cross the sound. Cathedral cliff, deserted village, Protestant mission. A spider's web, bleached in what sun there's been, stretches in a window of your home from home. Heaven knows the tales you left behind of war and soldiering, cities raised to the ground. I find a picture of the man in a beret, his laughing furrowed face, and a letter that says, in a couple of days we will watch shark fishing. We are very happy here. Um, I dare say uh, that happiness is something that we're all looking for, uh, that sense of um, uh, reconciliation with ourselves and with uh, the world around us. So maybe poetry provides that as well, does it? I don't know. What do you think? Is that a big, yeah. big too much of a question to finish on? Oh, I don't know. I'm for it. Um, okay. I don't know how to um, articulate it. I mean, you know, what, happiness, you know, one of the, th one of the things that I, and I'm, I'm not deflecting, but maybe I am, um, you know, but I'll, I'll come Deflect back. Deflect away. Um, you know, one of the, I can't remember where I, I must have been looking this up. You know, this is what I do, I suppose. I come across a word and I think, huh, where, where, how did that get there? Um, yeah. For some reason or another, I was looking up beauty, and uh, this is ages ago, and, I'm, and one of the definitions of beauty, the, the few of them that are offered, um, is one by, uh, by Stendhal, who says that beauty is the promise of happiness. And, you know, that's, that's okay. That works for me. You know, mm. the, the promise of I can of see a little epigraph coming out of that. I don't know. I think that might be a bit too... Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, too why good. not? Yeah. But, I mean, can it kind of provide that happiness? I'm willing to let it, certainly. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think? Can it, can it do that? Well, is there, is, there, is there a battle between inside a poet's uh, imaginative life uh, between the desire to respond to the world that they live in, whatever that may be, and a desire just to celebrate the joy of being, of just being here. What's the phrase again from Stendhal? Uh, beauty is the promise of happiness. Mm, I like that a lot. I like it a lot too. Oh, you have to use that. <laughs> but I mean, I what, what, what I think is, you know, is, is it the, the, two, the two positions you describe could could they be one? Could they, could that be one position to to you know to? I mean, I feel as though one might, one might have to insist on taking pleasure first. But I yes. suppose one can you know you can one can still observe or or what would a, what would a pure um, that pure kind of pleasure be? Um, I suppose it's one of those questions. Would it get tiresome after a while if you were? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that's the well, that's possibly one of the the great questions of you know of literary history. Um, from the you know the earliest of times to the present, is our life predicated upon a desire for 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 love and beauty and pleasure, or is there another level, another reality, another space uh, that we should seek out, uh, which is spiritual, or are or are they all one, and that what produces those is violence? the inhuman, the liar, uh, the mocker, uh, those who uh, misuse language. Mm. I mean, I always think that outside of physical abuse and mental abuse, one of, the, one of the things that I find so upsetting, distressing, is when people willfully misuse language because it's actually misusing truth. And that's what that is an issue that we're facing today. You, our generation, your generation, our generation together. Um, it is something that it's the contamination of language. Um, and I mean, I suppose to to be absolutely clear about where we stand as poets, we have no 
we can't change that. We can only register it and witness it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe one of the best ways of doing that is to celebrate the kinds of uh, the figures that you're, you, you've just been talking about uh, through comedy, through satire, mm -hmm. uh, and through the kind of joy that you have in language and which you bring to your poems. Um, that stands up in its own reality against the antagonisms of uh, politics. It's, it's its own witness. Mm -hmm. You can turn around and say, um, you know, without uh, getting into the politics of today, you know, the notion of uh, the Trumpian misuse of language, the uh, detachment of language from reality and truth, uh, that will find its own level in 10 years' time. Uh, whereas the joy of language will continue mm. and will knock it off its pedestal. Mm -hmm. You're kind to say, Jerry. Although I suppose um, another... Oh, I mean it, uh, an, I mean another, it, Stephen, I mean it. You know, another visit in uh, my favourite website, um, Etymology Online, um, would, would remind me that uh, the word witness and the word martyr are etymologically the same word. So, oh, really? you know, I, while, while I'm happy to witness, I, you know, there might be sacrifices involved in, um, in sticking to one's guns uh, for, the, for the sake of language, but... Uh, I know what side I'm on. I think we should finish right on that spot because I'm with you 100 percent on that too. Um, and my dog has just arrived in, so uh, that's a good point. That's a good point to say farewell. So we wrap it up there. Um, yeah.